Right, so who was here in January when I talked last? Ooh, not that many, great, okay. So it's a big, bit of a big surprise then. So um, what we're gonna cover today? Uh, first, I'd like to put some thanks out to some folks uh, because the last five months have been absolutely incredible and they've all kicked off from the meeting here on the 29th of January. Uh, then I'm gonna cover one technical subject which probably most people don't know about, which is a thing called MQTT which is this public su subscribe protocol. Um, we're gonna go into what I've learned since uh, I did that prototype and showed you that in January and maybe cover a bit of that for the people who weren't here, which is most of you actually, and talk about, about some of the really big issues that people worry about in IoT and how we've tried to attack them with this thing called Thing Studio, which is the spin-off and the result of what we made out of all of this. So first, on the shoulders of giants, you guys. Meteor, the Meteor folk. Oh my God, thank you for Meteor. Uh, we just couldn't have made this thing without Meteor. So this, that's the absolute first thing. Second thing is the community stuff. It's, you're here, which is amazing. Um, because it was through you, and I'll explain about that in a bit, that uh, this whole project spun off. It was actually your coverage, that nice video man, and uh, posting that on YouTube that actually did the amazing thing. So the community on Meteor is just fantastic. And, I'd like to give it up for you guys, really. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, and obviously, all those great, the really heavy duty package authors, the stuff that we stand on uh, in addition to Meteor that really does stuff. And there's one other thank you, which is to Paul Isloud Grieselhuber, and we'll tell you about him in a bit. Uh, quickly, on to MQTT. I've got a lot of slides to get through, so it's going to be a bit breakneck. Um, one of the fundamental protocols about IoT is this thing called MQTT. It's a pub-sub protocol, so if you've ever used any kind of messaging system, you're pretty much there about understanding how to use that. If you've never used pub-sub in programming, then you understand bulletin boards and the fact that unlike email, you send to a topic and not to a person. So that's about as much as I really want to say about MQTT. It's a pub-sub mechanism. It's extremely lightweight. Even tiny things like this can actually use MQTT. Um, Arduinos, all kinds of stuff can do it. And it also goes all the way up to enterprise. Uh, and some friends I'm, I've got in, in Switzerland just did a Erlang clusterable MQTT broker that can do sort of millions of transactions a second. Um, this is where we were last time, right? Where we joined up an MQTT broker uh, to a Meteor server and to a bunch of Internet of Things stuff, right? And then we'd used DDP at a low level to look like a, a Meteor collection, but actually it's a translated set of, uh, of messages coming off the, DDP, off the Meteor uh, MQTT stack. So that's great, and it's a very valid way of doing things, and it works real well. Um, but after doing that, I started really thinking about what I really wanted uh, and what people were worried about and sort of issues in uh, the Internet of Things. So one of these things is privacy. Um, this cartoon just about encapsulates it for everybody. I think we're all there, and that is we're worried about the data we send these big companies already. Look, I'd like a laugh. I just paid 23 quid to license this thing for this talk. Uh, thank you, that's better. Um, but truthfully, you know, it's not a joke. Um, we are concerned about these things, and it's, it's bad enough that Facebook is pirating our personal data. I, I shouldn't say that I'm going onto YouTube. But... Um, it, it is an important thing about governments, about all kinds of other folks. We've got this assumption we stick stuff in the cloud and then we, we pay for it in terms of what they're robbing, taking out of it. Um, another thing is scaling. Um, and to illustrate this, I'm going to show you some of the hardware that's coming along in just the next couple of months. Uh, is this, YPy. Program in Python, 24 euros. Ships in, in August. It uses MQTT. You know, that's a programming platform. Another one is the Oak. Fantastic. That's an Arduino compatible thing. That's again got Wi Fi. Really, really cheap things. The message out of this, and here is what I ordered this morning £6.84 for a Wi Fi development system with a 32 bit processor. Right? Um, the, the bottom line of this is it's going to be incredibly cheap to put devices into virtually anything. And the, these are retail prices, for God's sake, one offs. So, that message is this, and that is, regardless of the hype, and there's an awful lot of it, 
this really is going to be enormous. It's going to be a vast movement, and we're going to see vast numbers of devices and vast amounts of data, bigger than we've ever conceived of before. And that also implies, with all these different kinds of devices and being connected to things, things up, there's, people are going to need a lot of apps. At the end of the day, you know, um, these aren't much use and you get, unless you've got a way of talking to them. So the target for Thing Studio, which is a project we spun out, is we needed massive scalability. We needed real commitment to privacy and security. Uh, and we wanted it really easy to make UIs for people who aren't actually web professionals. So we modified the last architecture to look like this. We no longer connect Meteor Server to D uh, uh, MQTT. MQTT is now the responsibility of whoever's using it. The great thing is that uh, you can use a commercial router with MQTT built into it, a Raspberry Pi makes and a great you know, um, MQTT broker. We're going to see a lot of hubs, home hubs, and other kinds of things which are MQTT brokers. So we just pushed off that whole bit of infrastructure to whoever's using it. And that's not a great problem at the end of the day. But what it gives us is some fantastic properties. It means we never see people's Internet of Things data. We never touch it. We're, sca we're scalable, and we guarantee we've got a real promise about that. So we can compare and contrast. You know, this could be any one of dozens of companies, big and small, saying, we're doing, we're doing the Internet of Things, right? Uh, and that is, there's, there's your things. Stick it up into the cloud. We'll look at it, and then we'll give it back to you. And promise we're not going to look at it, honestly, really. Um, and what we've done is to say, no, we're not doing that. We're saying it's possible to provide a useful cloud service without intruding on your data. Right? And that's, that's the big change since last time I talked about this stuff, is that we really separated this out. And it gives us, as I say, this, this huge scalability because we're simply not touching the data. So, you know, you could be putting thousands of messages a, a, a minute through your, your Raspberry Pi, and it really will handle those kind of things, and it won't disturb us at all because we're not touching it. And we also can promise that we don't see stuff. So what we got with Think Studio is a cloud-based IDE, right? You've got a development environment in the, in, in the, in the cloud to, to do your development. Um, we store the templates and any code you generate. You don't actually need to do any code. You can do it just from HTML templates because we give you a set of standard helpers that will um, uh, basically allow you to do most stuff without, without doing anything. And I'll show you how that works in a second. Uh, but we dynamically compile that together. So basically, an app in our world is just a database query selecting the right bits of JavaScript, which we squidge together, dynamically compile, and put out on top of the basic runtime. Uh, and that means that we can deploy huge numbers of apps off one code base, right? And we've got very fine-grained granularity about what we pull in. Well, you don't, you're not carrying around some huge widget set because you only select the widgets you need, really. Um, I think, no, I'm going to go on to a bit of code here, and then we'll go to a bit of demo, because I know that, from experience, that if I go to the, actually, actually a browser, half the people at the back can't see see the code, so we're going to look at this. So here we are. This is a one-line dynamic readout, right? And, and we'll show you that. So what we've got is we now in the latest version, we've got built-in widgets, but you can make your own. And so those are deployed to you as web components, right? So TS for Think Thing Studio Just Style is the first widget. We only deployed this thing yesterday, so we're a bit new. Message says the last message from MQTT. Right? And desktop temp tells us which feed it's from. And that's dynamic, it's obvious. I mean, to all the Meteor folks here, that's, that's great. To people who've never seen Meteor, this is absolutely black magic. Right? And that renders that. That's all you have to write. So let's prove it, shall we? So, all right, so there is actually what I just showed you. Right? Um, and there's the HTML that does it. And this is a live edit, right? If you change this and update it, it will, it will display. And the nice thing, of course, again, being Meteor, if I've got it on a phone or a tablet or some other device, it will render there. So you can actually develop, have live data going through, developing as you're going along, and somebody holding a target device and watching you develop in front of, of you. All right. Uh, let's just try one more thing. I'm really chancing my arm here today. So yeah, if we switch this on. 
when it stops flashing, everybody duck. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm just hoping my, yeah, it's probable that my, my hotspot has turned itself off. Let's just turn it back on again. It does that. Let's see if we can get this to work. Sorry, bear with me. This is kind of difficult because you have to flash these, so it's difficult to set these things up for a while. Oh, we're on. So let's just do a little check. So it's quite deliberate. Right, we're back where we were. And hopefully, there we go. Not bad you. Anybody want to try it? <laughs> it's yeah, the knob on the <laughs> The black knob on the top. Just twist that around. Turn the dial. No, don't turn it off. <laughs> right, uh, can I have a slightly more <laughs> cooperative <laughs> demonstrator? Right, let's just check that it's still going. I think I'm going to quit while I'm ahead and not, not pass it around. Have you, have you ever measured the latency? Sorry? Have you ever measured the latency between... Well, I mean, this latency is going through a 3G hotspot, right? Uh, the point about the latency is that latency is completely under your control. If you, put a route, if you put a router here, if you're running through a local network, it's milliseconds. I mean, small numbers are milliseconds. Because if we just go back, you're making me do this, aren't you? I'm going to have to shift this up here now. Uh, if I go back to the, the diagram, I can't remember where I am now. Yeah, here we go. Shift out to the side. So if we look at the architecture, this is under your control. This can be a local network. Every, every component in here can be on your desk. So the round trip can be exactly as short as you want. Right? It can also be some enterprise MQTT broker out in the cloud. It's, I don't care. Right? That's not to do with us. So that we can have extremely small latencies. And, and you know, another time, I'll show you the, the HTML5 powered car, because we can actually drive you know, route control vehicles around, because the latency is quite short enough to do that nicely. And I built one. I just haven't had time while we've been building this out. So. This is really one of the more difficult things I've ever done. Uh, if we go back here. So uh, that allows us to do, as you can see, uh, dynamic monitoring of stuff. If we go back now and do a very basic output, this is <coughs> Robert's fam famous doorbell. So just one line. I'll, sh I'll show you the line in a second. But basically, you put some. Um, some special attributes, you, all you do is you do some custom attributes onto anything that will generate events, and, and it'll render that. And when it presses, that rings my doorbell. And it really does do that, but we don't have a link to my doorbell. Um, if we want to look at more interesting things, yeah, shush. I've had enough doorbells. <laughs> right? Um, we can do time series stuff. And that is because the data is being fed into MiniMongo. We can add a bit of processing to it. This one just stores the last 50 values. right? So the display logic and the processing logic of what we do are separated so that, for example, in this case, we're keeping a journal. Another thing is we could keep a rolling average and smooth that out. Right? Um, so the other thing is, as I say, apps. So in this case, apps, we've got a number of them here, are just a, um, a database query. So it, it means that if you define an app, it is a set of things bound together by an app ID. So when you hand somebody a URL, you can just send them a URL to share. And they, in addition to the basic runtime, the basic thing studio runtime, pull down just specifically those things that you've given them to share. And you've got this fine-grained ability to generate an app. Uh, so we can actually deploy thousands and thousands, well, unlimited number of apps. Um, in uh, you know off Thing Studio off the same code base, and in fact the realization is, having done that, I then thought, okay, great. So now I can make custom widgets, and all these things are are other templates. They're just a template with some special definitions, and they're presented as a web component, and you can then include those in your templates, right? So I practically don't have to make anything now anymore in the core of Thing Studio because we've got this fine-grained inclusion process. <coughs> 